This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. I, um... You know, I've been, I've been, I've been thinking. Something that's been on my mind for a while is these, uh, uh, these darn braggarts. And I, I got this harebrained idea. You know, you remember back when we were doing, uh, we did a whole big thing about caramelizing honey. And I know a couple of you said something that uh, I think it was Jeff said something about he's doing it in, in a crock pot. Like Chris mentioned, uh, the uh, pressure cooker thing, and so I, you know, I I probably did about now oh, 15 pounds of honey, just trying different things in the, in the pressure cooker. Well, I was really uh, I, I wanted more control, and I thought you know that crock pot thing is probably the way to go. And so I emailed Jeff today. Jeff knows all about this. So I emailed Jeff. I said, Jeff, you know what? What setting do you use on your crock pot uh, when you're caramelizing honey? So he wrote me back. So I told him, I'm on my way to Target uh, to get a small little little uh, cheap crock pot, like a $12 crock pot. So I get there, and there, there's actually two of them sitting on the shelf. One of them's red, and the other one's black. And I thought, God damn, I wanted to be able to see the honey in the bottom of the crock pot. Well, sitting right next to it is this. <laughs> now, these are like two quart crock pots. These, these are small enough. I mean, I don't even think I could fix a meal in them big enough for me. Um, I know Chris wouldn't put up with it. Uh, so this, this one sitting next to it is like 2.5 quart. But it's like $30. <laughs> It's white, okay, uh, versus the the red one and the black one. So guess which one JD came home with? The thirty dollar one. <laughs> uh, just because I wanted to be able to see the honey uh, change colors. Uh, so my my little my little will start out to be like a twelve dollar crock pot uh, turned into a three. It just thing's fancy too, guys. It's got this lid that locks down on top. I guess you could take the darn thing, put it in a car, put it in a trunk, you know, and it won't spill because the lid kind of locks down on this thing. So, uh, but anyway, so that, that, that's my crock pot story for the, for the day. <laughs> um, when you, uh, when you were te- given the little teaser on that, I was worried that you had a boil over or something. So I, I guess <laughs> we're, <laughs> Splurging on a little bit more of a fancy crock pot. That's not too bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm, you know, I'm well, I'll just... give you a similar story. Uh, I, I get online to, to order a, uh, a grain bill um, for an idea that I've got. And I'm thinking this is, you know, going to be 25, 30 bucks, you know, a few pounds of grain, a couple ounces of hops, and, and I'm good to go. Maybe a packet of yeast, 30 bucks at the most. And then I yeah. started thinking, you know, I'm going to try that Y East nutrient. We get some of that. And then I thought, eh, I'm going to need another bag or two, a mesh bag. So I threw a couple of those in. And, oh, yeah, I need a new aeration stone. And uh, I better, you know, I better pick up another foam stopper and flask because I'm going to have to do a starter on this. And so by the time it's, uh, it's like 250 bucks. By the time I'm finished <laughs> for what was going to be a thirty a thirty dollar order, you know, and yeah, so I, and when I looked at the cart, I look I went to the checkout cart and I looked at it and I looked at the total and I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to wait a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all know what a tightwad you are, too. Uh... Yeah, I don't like spending money. <laughs> yeah. Hey, welcome to the Mead House. Uh... We uh, we got a pretty good show for you tonight. Ryan is out of town, so uh, he won't be with us tonight. But uh, 
Aaron Martin's in the house. Mississippi Chris Spencer. Now he may be, may or may not be here for the duration of the show. Uh, and Jeff Shouse uh, is also in the house. My name is Jay. Uh, the Mead House, themeadhouse dot com. Uh, the replays. I mean, they're all over the place. Look, uh, look on iTunes, Stitcher Radio. Uh, you name it. Uh, they're also, of course, featured right here at home. Themeadhouse dot com. Um, and hey, if you want to call the show, uh, 818-921-4680, happy to take your call. Uh, Jeff, I want to throw a shout out real quick before I throw it over to you. Uh, to, now, Tony, I'm going to butcher your last name. Fair warning. Okay. Uh, Tony Cormier, 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 uh, you're just going to have to correct me, I guess, uh, on the Facebook deal there, Tony, but. I got this message just a little bit, probably 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago. Uh, Tony's been, he's an avid listener, and he's uh, heard me mention my Kahlua a couple of times on the show. Apparently, uh, Tony's uh, family has been making homemade Kahlua since the, prohibit- since the Prohibition days. Nice. Uh, and he wants to compare recipes, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and, uh, Chris, he's, uh, he's really looking forward to your discussion on the pectic enzyme and the cannabinoid tablets and all of that. And of course, uh, to, uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff's going to talk to us about mouthfeel, what all that means to us and everything. So, uh, thanks for listening, Tony. Enjoy the show, my friend. I know he's listening live tonight. Uh, Jeff, what did you find on Facebook today? Well, I got a couple of shout outs. Uh, these are both from the meat group. One of them, uh, Kellen Williams has, uh, a couple experiments in the vein of Heart of Darkness that, uh, I, I thought I'd throw a shout out to just because I know Mississippi's, uh, been experimenting with some, some, some stuff similar to that. Uh, looks like he had, uh, about four and a half pounds per gallon of, uh, honey, uh, as a start. And then he did, uh, it looks like he has one experiment that, uh, he added fruit and primary and then another one where he added the fruit and secondary kind of to see which one he prefers. Uh, so yeah, interesting stuff and thought of uh, throw a shout out to him. And then, um, another name I'm going to butcher Michael Rishi Rishi on mead had uh, a photo of a bottle of a 40 year old mead and an oh, earthen wow. jar. Um, it's, it's a Polish mead. It, the, the name of it, Part in English, part in Polish, is a delicious Polish mead, Mielniak, Miod Pitni. Um, really interesting looking stuff. And I know the the Polish actually have a, a fairly well established history of mead to the point that uh, a lot of their uh, styles or recipes are considered historical when it comes to BJCP judging. So that I thought actually might even be an interesting topic for us to kind of branch briefly into some of the, the historical um, types of meat out there. Um, yeah. But yeah. This, uh, it looks like this stuff is very, very sweet. Um, and uh, a, a big chunk of it is, is made with raspberry juice. The, uh, the Mjolnjök indicates that from uh, being derivative of their word for, for raspberries. Um, that sounds interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, th- that was just a very cool 40-year-old bottle of mead. It's definitely something that piqued my interest. I was like, oh, hello. Yeah, cool. You know, I'd be, uh, I, you know, all of my, uh, all of my uh, research and everything that I was doing on mead before I, you know, started in on all this stuff, I mean, uh, it just all, it, it all basically comes from the European countries. And I'm surprised how many European countries uh actually even still get into the mead making it's like a big thing over there so uh and a lot of the a lot of the old uh, recipes of course what, what's the name of that book um went right out right right off the top of my freaking head here what's the name of that book's got that uh that old recipe in it uh oh the dill dib dillbees or something like that so, yeah come on yeah. guys um uh. Sir, yes, William, sir, somebody from his closet or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's got some really old recipes, uh, European stuff. So I would be, uh, I would be interested in exploring that uh, on a few shows too. Um, 
We uh, because uh, Aaron, because uh, Ryan's not here tonight. We we're kind of we had our, our little list of things we wanted to talk about. Uh, we're not going to do it in in the order that we started out. So we're actually going to start out with uh, Jeff. Uh, you know, Jeff, my mead making here. You know, I make stuff. Uh, it, it tastes good, but there's always something missing. And I just, I, I couldn't put my finger on it until I started tasting other people's meads. And uh, I think it has everything to do with mouthfeel. And I've been thinking about that for a while. And so when I, when I, when I drink my, the, my commercially made wines that I buy or, or the beers that I buy, I'm, I'm trying to tune into that. Just exactly, you know, what, what is this mouthfeel? What does it mean? What am I tasting? What does it feel like? That kind of thing. And I thought, you know, maybe maybe we should spend some time talking about mouthfeel and how to introduce. Well, first of all, let's talk about exactly what it is. What what is this mouthfeel? How do we find it when we take a sip? Um, what are we looking for? And then sure. secondly, how do we how do we replicate that? How do we introduce that into our meat? Because like I say, some of the stuff that I make, I mean, it's water. It tastes good, but it's like drinking water. Sure. Well, and I think you're right. the 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 whole idea of mouthfeel is it, it's not something we focus on immediately, but it can be that extra little ten percent that really makes the difference between a good mead and a really great mead. Um, when we talk about mouthfeel, usually there's actually a couple terms we talk about. We talk about mouthfeel or we talk about body. Uh, they're very similar concepts, usually in, in terms of judging or in terms of like wine tasting. They, they tend to get lumped together because they're really similar. When we talk about body, we're talking about basically your, your perception of like the weight of the liquid or the viscosity of the liquid, how the, uh, how heavy the liquid feels. If, if you'll pardon the, the generalization there. Uh, whereas mouthfeel is, um, it, it's kind of the touch sensations of your perception. Um, you could get a, a feeling of smoothness, of creaminess, or of uh, a little bit of an acid bite, uh, a tannic pucker. Uh, it, it, it's the way that your, your touch uh, nerves in your mouth kind of respond to it as opposed to the your, your taste buds or your uh, your nose inhaling the uh, the sense of the liquid in your mouth, um, and it is important. It, it's actually highly studied in not only wine and beer but in food in general. Uh, the that that perception of how it feels. Our mouths are actually just like chock a box full of these little nerve endings, so it, it makes a level of sense. And really, when we're talking about mouthfeel. We're talking about essentially just having something that's pleasant to drink. Um, it, depending on the the type of brew you're going for, if you're looking for something that feels you know, like rounded or balanced. It, it might have a, a subtle, smooth mouthfeel. It might feel really rich and round. Um, th there's different possibilities there. But if what you want to avoid or things like you mentioned that are they're watery, they're thin. Uh, they might be harsh or aggressive. They might be uh, rough, uh, too syrupy or too thick and viscous can be a bad thing too. And really, when it comes to mouthfeel, what we're looking for, I, I've, I've harped on this again and again, is, is good balance. Um, so when you talk about something that feels really watery and thin, Generally, that can be a little bit too much, uh, too much on the acid side. Um, whereas, if it's if it's lower in the acid, um, that that can make something that feels like kind of flat or flabby, just not very, um, not very springy. The the fine uh, fine line between the two is kind of where you want to be with that. Uh, in the case of having something that's really acidic, a little bit extra residual sugar, even something small like half a percent can actually give you a nice little bump. And there's a lot of different ways to accomplish that. I mean, for one, you could always back sweeten. It's, uh, when it comes to be, that's an, an easy way to take it. 
um, very small amounts at the time and give you a little bit more feel to it. Uh, Mississippi has mentioned a time or two before that adding like half a banana, uh, an overripe banana um, in mm. primary can give you yeah. some extra mouthfeel. I think part of that actually comes down to um, Oops, you okay there? Yeah, I, I, my uh, my microphone fell out here. Um, the part of that comes down to sugars that are harder for the uh, the yeast to digest. Um, something that's really common for a lot of these higher body applications are what they refer to as polysaccharides. It, it's basically like a long chain of sugar molecules. Um, you can get those from a number of different sources. Uh, you, you find those in, in fruit, especially the skins. That's why uh, red wines especially are uh, are known for aging on grape skins. Uh, there are a number of different yeasts that just make those as part of their byproducts. So uh, that's kind of like the in the uh, the same vein as those fruity esters that we, uh, we like to talk about. Yeah. Um, you can get those also just from the uh, the breakdown of yeast cells too. And so like, um, when we were talking about D47 and aging on the leaves, that's kind of the same idea. You you want those uh, decaying yeast cells to create some of those polysaccharides that, um, or, or protein chains, I should say, in this case, that uh, that contribute to that that feel or that flavor. Um, another thing that really strongly contributes to mouthfeel is tannin levels, and uh, tannins are where you get that that uh, harsh pucker if it's a little too hard. Um, Without it, it can feel a little bit one-dimensional and a little bit boring. So again, you know, a lot of these these uh, dimensions here are we're talking about balancing, getting just a little bit extra, just a little bit more or less. They really dial in the the perfect like flavor and experience, not just flavor, but also the the qualitative like fun of drinking it, if you will. Yeah. How, uh, how, what, how do you, I mean, you mentioned the banana, the banana thing, and I've heard Chris talk about that, but, uh, I mean, you, how do you introduce, uh, now, I mean, here again, I mean, it's not, this isn't something where you're, I mean, are we looking to change the flavor here? Or I don't think I'm looking to change the flavor. I, I want something that, like you were explaining, something that tastes, tastes, right in my mouth it's just it's not watery and and loose and uh, you know yeah there's there's actually a lot of different approaches to this of course uh obviously you can tinker with the acid levels by you know doing an acid blend or specific acids like malic or uh, tartaric acid that's um, kind of dangerous isn't it <laughs> it's chancy everything is chancy though with with dialing this in well you'd want to do it just a little at a time you could add residual sugars like I was talking about before. Uh, you can also explore different yeast strains because some yeasts are more attenuative than others and they'll leave more of that residual sugar, uh, different like protein chains and polysaccharides and stuff afterwards. Yeah. Um, so it, part of that is going to be just coming from yeast character or different other things you can kind of tinker with towards the end. Uh, you know, we can talk about oak aging or aging on vanilla, cocoa nibs, things like that, those are all going to give some level of tannin. Um, oak being, of course, the, the really predominant one. There. Um, what, what, what about tea. using uh, uh, what, what about using some kind of a wine tannin? I mean, you go to, you, you know, you go to Midwest Supply and Northern Brewer and more beer, more wine, all these places out there, they, you can actually buy all, I mean, there's a whole realm of different kinds of tannins out there now, granted this is more for the wine industry but i mean you know i mean we've adapted so much from i think from the wine industry into mead making so why why not uh but they they make white wine tannins and red wine tannins could you use those uh as well uh yeah, yeah. when my first couple of batches i actually had just a, a a powdered oak tannin that i used for uh for my tannin levels it works okay. It can be a little bit one dimensional. You don't get all of that, that nice oak character that you get from aging on oak, but it works. You can get tannin some out of it. Um, yeah. Some of the best tannin can come from black tea. 
um, easy Black to control. Team, yeah. yeah. Now that that's the that's the um, gosh, we just went through this, Chris. It's it's not the flavored stuff. It's the it's a straight black tea. Yeah, just straight right. black tea, something like an Irish breakfast tea or something. Yeah. Um, real good way to get tanning in without overdoing it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, another another thing you could do to add more of the, the body, and in this case we're talking more about like kind of a, a thickness or a perceptual sweetness, uh, a number of wine producers use um, gums, like gum Arabic, to give it a little bit extra boost in that regard. It doesn't actually change the flavor or, or boost a lot of the sweetness of it, uh, but it, it adds a little bit to the, the viscosity or the thickness of the wine and, yeah. and helps it that way. I haven't really seen that on the, the home winemaking, home meat making market, uh, but I know that's that's been mentioned as a common technique for, for kind of bumping that with the, the industry as a whole. Don't they use glycerin also? I believe so. Yeah, I've seen I've, I've seen, seen that mentioned on a couple of wine sites that I visit. Yeah. Yeah, I think the I think glycerin is like the major component in. Uh, uh, what they call wine conditioners and things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, um, I you know, it seems like a, it seems like that's the biggest thing that I struggle with uh, when I'm making, you know, just just a straight up honey and water mead. You know, I mean, the final product, although it tastes good, it's just it's just got this thin, watery. It doesn't leave you with any kind of anything, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, not something that that you know you want to get excited about. So, uh, just looking for ways to try to improve that feel in your mouth that makes you want to take another sip or pour another glass. Uh, you know, and that's something that we really we really haven't gone into any kind of detail about on the show yet right. it's probably one of the one of the most important oh you know last week we talked about the uh, the uh, uh, entering into competition and so this is going to be uh, at least I would assume this is going to be an extremely important aspect of your mead when a judge takes that first sip right it's not going to be an extremely important part it is a part of the the whole components you're judged on um but it it is a fact um and it it contributes more than you would think to the overall experience of it which is also something you're judged on uh in the case of a a kind of a thinner waterier wine uh like i mentioned before i'm I'm sorry a thinner waterier uh, mead uh that that could be indicative of something a little bit more acidic um another thing we should talk about and i don't think we've talked about it very much is the difference between like pH and total acidity? Um, because the there are also kits that you can buy in your home wine store that measure total acidity, and something that is higher in acid content, but maybe not perceptually so, uh, would would be more indicative with that kind of a test than with uh, uh, pH, or it's something just like taste testing it. Um, it, it. It might be a case where you're you're getting more acid than you realize, and that's kind of throwing off that that flavor or that taste. And maybe a, a little bit of residual sugar or a balance with some tannins would do it good. Um, you know, like I've I've said more than once that generally when I do a uh, a traditional or something with a really light flavor to it, I like to um, to use oak just as a uh, not to get the oaky flavor so much as just to get some tannins into it uh, that are really smooth and subtle. Uh, you generally don't taste that oak character in it, but it makes a big difference in terms of the mouthfeel. It kind of helps give it that little extra something. So that that's always been a favorite approach to mine. Yeah. And Jeff, you might also mention a little bit about uh, ABV. You know, that can greatly affect um, the body, and especially, um, and it doesn't always work the same way with the, with different beverages either. 
That's true. Yeah, you know, uh, no, like for instance, in a in a uh, malt based beverage, uh, more alcohol tends to make it more watery to some extent, whereas in most meads, a higher ABV is going to add more body to it. And well, to some extent, yes, and to some extent, no. I mean, if it also depends on some of the qualities you get from uh, fermentation, because the 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 fusel alcohols you can get from a hot ferment um can can add to that sense of uh a sense of dryness or that that harsh kind of sting that comes with being really acidic Hello. on the camp. Hey, hang on, Ryan. <laughs> go go ahead, Jeff. So uh yeah, the uh higher or lower alcohol content can can affect that as well. Um an, another thing, especially in the beer world, um Having more alcohol in it tends to make it feel drier, tends to make it sting a little bit more. Um, so you, you tend to go for, with your beers looking for more, um, more body, you tend to go for either a malt, like a Munich malt that has less enzyme activity and is therefore like less utilized by the yeast. Go for a yeast that will digest less of the, uh, the available like malts and sugars and things like that that way. So that you leave a little bit more behind. Yeah. Um, and again, that just comes back to yeast character and things like that too. Interesting. Ryan, uh, I just got a text from Ryan. Apparently he felt, uh, completely ignored, probably, uh, sitting by himself in a hotel room, uh, just bored to death. And he sent me a text. It says, please, please bring me. <laughs> How are you doing, Ryan? I am doing wonderful, coming at you <laughs> live from uh, West Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> and you are right. I am in the uh, third floor of a Marriott and uh, thought, hey, I want to talk to my friends. Bored to death. Do they, have a, better. <laughs> do they have a wild party night life there in Des Moines? Well, it's it's 828 and I'm in the hotel room talking to you, Chris. Oh, that's boring, man. <laughs> yeah, he's bored to death. <laughs> yeah, he's got to do um, Well, you know, Jeff, I can see this. Uh, we could probably do a, a, a few more segments on, on talking about this stuff and really kind of dialing in here a little bit. But uh, I want to kind of move into uh, Mississippi because I know uh, we're, he's, he's probably pressed for time. How are you doing for time, uh, Chris? I'm doing good right now. Okay. Um, you know, so the other thing about now, now, now Chris is going to do this segment uh, because he's like the Melamel guy of the house. Okay. I mean, if you, anything you ever want to know about Melamel, Mississippi Chris Spencer is the guy to talk to here at the meet house. So uh, I thought, you know, uh, and I've, I've talked about some of this stuff with Chris too. Uh, like you said on another show, he's sometimes sometimes my go-to guy when I got some questions. Um, Chris, you know, melomels. We're talking fruit here, and yeah. uh, you know, as you well know, uh, you know, all of this fruit requires some maintenance. Okay, you just can't dump, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, cut-up peaches into a bucket. Add some honey and some water, and expect this miracle peach mead to come, uh, you know, out in uh, you know a couple of months. So there is some preparation that needs to happen to the fruit first to avoid some troubles down the line. So let's talk about that for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Well, you you first you've got to know obviously what kind of mead you're going to make. Uh, if you're doing wine style, if you're doing sack mead, or you're doing uh, something more along the lines of a hydromel. Uh, so once you've got this figured out, now I, uh, you make me out to be the uh, the expert on melomels, and I am by no means. Uh, I certainly uh, I certainly still do my fair share of experimentation. Um, and but but I have had quite a bit of success in it also. Um, you know, 
how do you want to approach your getting your fruit into your mead? Uh, and there's there's several ways to do this. We you know you got fruit juices, you've got fruit concentrates, you've got frozen fruit, uh, fruit that you've grown your own um, or pick fresh. Uh, there's, there's lots of ways to do this. Um, is fresh fruit better? Yeah, yeah, most of the time. Um, but that does not mean that you can't make some really good melomels from concentrates and juices. Uh, and there's plenty of people out there that are going to tell you that you can't. Uh, I know you can because I've done it. Mm -hmm. Um, you've got a lot of things to consider when you're dealing with fruit, but what we're going to focus on right now is using whole fruit. We're going to either frozen or fresh picked, either one. Um, that's what I want to focus on because that's most people's best option. Uh, and you have the most uh, selection to, to, to buy from at the supermarket or farmer's market or uh, a pick your own. Um, so generally, uh, I used to throw fruit into a bucket and not worry about it. And if you want to do that, you certainly can. Uh, and I never had a problem with that. But I then, later on, I discovered something that uh, made a huge difference in, in the melomels that I was making, and it was called lalazine. Now, mm -hmm. <clears throat> most of you have are familiar with pectic enzyme, um, and, and basically it breaks down the pectins. It helps in the clearing of your melomel and and it does help to extract some of the juices and flavors uh however that the lalazine and it's a it's a lalamond product uh contains quite a few different enzymes and um so what we're doing is we're attacking lots of different aspects here lots of different starches um uh different uh sugars and um, even to the extent of some of the like the polyphenol content which is going to translate into more tannin extraction more color extraction um, and these are all things that are present in the fruit if you eat a piece of fruit by itself you you're getting all those things as you chew it so if you want that to translate into your mead, you're going to have to extract it from the fruit. And this lalazine product helps to do that. However, it does need some time to work. And um, generally four or five days uh, will will really get pretty much everything you want out of the fruit. Um so this sort of presented a problem. How do you let fruit sit for four or five days without it starts to ferment spontaneously? So basically what I started doing is um, getting a bucket with a sealable lid and an airlock. And um, it's important to have an airlock because even though we're going to sulfite this fruit, it could possibly still start fermenting. And if you don't have an airlock on there, your bucket's going to explode. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So what I like to do is to take my fresh fruit, regardless of what it is, whether it's berries, peaches, or whatever. Uh, I like to mash it up uh, in the bucket. Uh, try not to crack the seeds or anything because you don't want to extract things from the seeds. But uh, just something that you would mash similar to mashing it with your hand. Uh, add just a little bit of water, just enough to dissolve your sulfites, uh, Camden tablet or, or whatever, whether you're using powder or, or the tablets. Uh, stir that sulfite into that fruit thoroughly along with your lalazine. Uh, put the lid on and airlock it. Uh, the sulfites should prevent any kind of fermentation and the lalazine will sit there for four or five days. And at the end of four or five days, your fruit is going to be literally just almost all juice. Um, yeah. 
and it's very easy to separate out if you want to at that point. But what I normally do is drain off the juice, mix up my must, and that gives me a very accurate starting gravity. Uh, if you put whole fruit in that hasn't gone through this process, your starting gravity is going to change as that fruit begins to break down and release its juices. Um, sure. And yeah. more often than not, your your starting gravity is actually going to go down because even though the juice has sugar in it, it doesn't have enough sugar in it to raise the gravity. It's got more water, so it dilutes it. So what you thought was a starting gravity of 1120, by the time you put the fruit in, may end up being 1100, 1105, or something like that. Interesting. Yeah, through, I never, never thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you go through this process, Pour the juice in, mix up your must, then you can pull the pulp out, and you can go ahead and put the pulp in as well once you get your starting gravity. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what I started doing with all my fruit. Yes, it's a little more messy. Uh, in fact, it's really messy. When I was doing this heart <laughs> murmur uh, project here and all this testing, it looked like somebody was murdered in my kitchen. Uh, <laughs> If you if you want to make a mess, go get some red raspberries and do this, and uh, it, it looks like something was slaughtered in your kitchen. Well, yeah. But, what, what were you, what were you using to mash the raspberries? A four by four or something? <laughs> yeah, I do, I keep a two by four that, two that by I four. use to mash berries and fruit. Yeah, it works fine. Yeah, well, I'm so, still fighting it anyway. Uh, sure. So yeah. what this is, Chris. Do you have, do you, when you use the lalazime, do you notice any difference or have you ever tried freezing the fruit first versus just using it uh, totally fresh? Well, I normally do freeze it. Um, I don't, re- I don't really know that if it, it's necessary because number one, I'm crushing it. And number two, the lalazime does such a good job that I really don't think there's anything to gain um, from freezing it other than maybe the fact that I've heard that freezing can actually kill some wild yeast. So maybe there's a benefit there, uh, but I sulfide it anyway. Just remember, though, when you get ready to, uh, to use this after your four or five days, you're going to have to take that lid off and cover it with a cloth for 24 hours, and you need to stir it occasionally during that 24-hour period to get that sulfite to come out. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to ferment it. Yeah. So don't I know. That uh, step as well. When I was working on that, I still have that peach thing going here that's just kind of kicking back and taking its sweet time, but. Uh, this is one of the projects I contacted Chris on with this lalazime thing. Uh, really kind of unsure because I've never used it before, but he's absolutely right. When he talked about breaking down the fruit, I mean, I had, I don't remember what it was, 25 or 27 pounds of peaches, uh, in this five gallon bucket. And I added this, uh, I believe it's called lalazime EX, Chris. Uh, is that, yeah, uh, is that you, something? Yeah, you used, uh, you used two different ones. You used the EX and the C-Max. Yeah, yeah. And let me tell you, after four days, the fruit was reduced to nothingness. I mean, it was just a, it was just a pile of pulp. I mean, just liquid almost like you put it in a blender on a low speed and then dumped it back in the bucket. I mean, it was just, it was just amazing how it just destroyed, uh, the fruit. So. Yeah, it really does. It gets everything out. Uh, but like I said, use your juice from it, uh, strain that into your must, get everything mixed up, get an accurate gravity. But then once you've got that, go ahead and put your skins and pulp and whatever's left in your bucket. Uh, go ahead and put that in your must as well because uh, it, there's not enough left there to change the gravity. Um, so 
significantly. So uh, not only have you extracted everything the fruit has to offer, but you've also got a, a more accurate starting gravity. Um, you get more color, more tannin, more flavor, more everything from it, and and all the the uh, sugar contribution. I was um, just going to say when we were talking to Jeff about the mouthfeel, tannins, that kind of thing. There's an advantage to leaving the skins in. I think he mentioned the, uh, you know, the wine, you know, red wines uh, sitting on the grape skins for, uh, you know, during aging period. So. Uh, sure, and yeah. uh, and uh, and another that's a, you know that's something else we need to do um, in the upcoming shows. Maybe after our two week break, we need to spend some time on piments. Yeah. Uh, there are just, I mean, we we are lacking in in the commercial world. We are lacking really really good piments of any kind of quantity. Every now and then you run up on a on a good one. Sergio had a good one um, over at Melavino, and I've had one other that was was really good. But that's something we need to spend some time on is is pilots. Yeah, um, yeah, I got a couple of those going. Do you? What, um, what, what, what were you using? Well, we talked about this after the show once. I've got a uh, a red blend, which is made up of uh, Zinfandel and Pinot Noir juice, and then I use the Trader Joe's Mesquite honey because mm-hmm. I think those that'll from what I've heard from you, JD, that's going to play nicely against that uh, that Zinfandel uh, juice. Yeah, it could. It could very well, yeah. Well, if it's not, you got a case coming your way. <laughs> this is JD's fault. Uh, I'm thinking about something like a either a Gewurztraminer or a Riesling juice with something like my sourwood honey that has a certain oh yeah uh, spicy. It's got a spiciness to it, which would just go perfect with the Riesling or the Gewurztraminer. Yeah, or maybe That's even the, something uh, like a Simeon or something. That that second one I've got going is the uh, a Gertzaminer, a uh, Sauvignon Blanc, and a Chenin Blanc with um, juices with a, um, uh, a white clover honey. Wow, that sounds good too. And that's got a certain spiciness too. It's got, the way I like to describe this white clover honey is it's got uh, a cinnamon spice to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good white clover honey is very underestimated by mead makers. Um, Because when you hear clover, you automatically think generic, but good white clover honey makes excellent mead. I um well I think we uh, sufficiently covered the melomel handling of fruit and the Camden on all of that. There's good information there. I'm sure that uh, if we dialed down, there's probably a little bit more we could spend on it. But uh, Chris, uh, checking your time, are you uh, still good? Uh, I'm good for another fifteen or so. I'll I'll hang around. Okay, well, uh, well, I, I I skipped right past the what we were drinking because I wanted to get into this thing uh, because uh, I didn't want to bust into your time and have to you know have you hustle through your your segment. But uh, wanted to get into the uh, what we're drinking. I'll start it off this time, guys. I'm drinking a Samuel Smith Imperial Stout because I'm I, I've got I've got this stout thing on my mind with the caramelized honey. So I'm thinking braggot stout type of thing here. So, but this imperial stout, this is this is outstanding. This is really good. Uh, Samuel Smith, it's a, this is a British import uh, imperial stout, and um, quite different than the Irish stout like Guinness. This is a little more. 
uh, it's, it's, it's got a little bit more hoppiness to it than the, than the Irish stouts that I've had. This isn't uh, nearly, uh, there's no real sweet component in here like I've had out of the Guinness or some of these other, other Irish stouts. Um, but I'm really digging this. This has got a, a really dark roasted coffee, uh, deep roasted coffee. This is something that I think uh, Mississippi might even enjoy. But uh, uh, with that, let's toss it over to Aaron. Uh, did you uh, manage to pop the top on anything tonight, Aaron? I did, actually. Polishing off the last of a bottle from this past weekend, this is that meadery that I've recently discovered out of Chicago, Wild Blossom Meadery and Winery. And this is a Cran Nectar, it's called. It's actually 80% honey wine and 20% cranberry wine. And this has got to be one of the most unique melomels that I've had for a couple of reasons. I, I think number one, I just haven't, I don't know that I've had any other cranberry melomels. Um, I, I just have to say, I mean, this, it's just a very intense cranberry flavor, like cranberry sauce that you would have with your, you know, your Thanksgiving turkey. Um, so it's, it's real tart, but then it's also pretty high on the sweetness level, which really balances it out. Very nicely, and I think from some of the other melomels that I've had from this meadery, this is probably my favorite one. Uh, it's weighing in at a 12% ABV, and uh, just really, really enjoying this one. Wow. You know, I make homemade cranberry sauce at Thanksgiving, and I cut up an orange. I thinly, uh, I thinly slice an orange, peel and all and uh, chuck that into my uh, cranberries as they're cooking. And when it comes out, it's got this nice tangy orange flavor. Uh, that sounds like a uh, a plan uh, that we can throw on the uh, brew list as well, too. So There you uh, go. I You know, tasting this now, thinking of some orange flavor in there would be perfect in this, too. Jeff, uh, what did you pour tonight? Well, I, I had one of my favorite uh box um the Einger celebrator it's a doppel box it's, a, it's an authentic german box really dark malty flavor just a little touch of hops uh, like i said it, it's one of my wife and i's favorite favorite box styles and um really delicious it's already gone so i have to put myself on mute sneak into the kitchen and pour myself something else here shortly Jeff, you and I must have some sort of connection with the box because it seems like every time that I start thinking about them, you're either thinking the same thing or you're drinking one. <laughs> well, yeah, I keep them in the house to keep the wife happy. There's no secret about that. Yeah. All right. Is everybody back? I'm still here. Yep, okay. Sure. I just, we, <laughs> uh, the audience is probably going to hear uh, some silence in there. I just had a call come in and uh, it did not, uh, when I clicked OK, why it put all the rest of you on hold. Not supposed to do that. So thanks again, Skype. Um, and uh, the caller, if you're, if you're listening, uh, let's see. I don't know. Uh, go to go to our Facebook page. Type your phone number in, and uh, let me try to give you a call back. So, uh, uh, whoever called us on the show, go to the Mead House Facebook page. Uh, put your number in and uh, in a message there, and uh, uh, let us try to uh, get you back on the show. So, uh, with that, I apologize, guys, but. Um, who were we talking to, Jeff? I think, Jeff, we were talking to you about uh, what you had in your cup tonight. Yeah, we were just finishing up on the box. I don't know how much got recorded there, but uh, I was mentioning having my favorite uh, uh, double box, the, the Iinger Celebrator. And uh, to, to be honest, uh, the Iinger Brewery in Germany may be one of my favorite breweries ever. They have so many good, uh, solid beers that come out. 
generally the store that I get these from, the, they tend to run like three or four bucks a bottle. Uh, but it, it's not hard to justify grabbing one or two every time I go in there uh, and see something new or something that I, I really love. They have actually a, a Weizen box, a wheat-based box, uh, that is delicious. And, and it really makes me want to explore that as an option for a bracket as well. Perfect. Sounds good. Uh, sorry, guys. I'm sitting here writing down a phone number. Um, Chris. Chris is probably drinking coffee tonight because I know he's got to go back to the hospital, right? <laughs> uh, Lipton iced tea. Lipton iced tea. <laughs> yeah, it's got it's got a beautiful profile of orange pico and black tea. Uh, just the right amount of tannin and sugar. Uh, and I'm having it on the rocks. So. On the rocks. There you go. <laughs> and Ryan, Ryan, poor Ryan, stuck in a uh, stuck in a hotel room. Uh, uh, did you manage to bring anything with you, or at least hit the liquor store up, or the little uh, uh, gotcha store downstairs, or what's going on there? Ryan, <laughs> did we lose Ryan? Sorry guys, I'm here. I'm here. Oh. Um, I uh, I did have a nice dinner in town, and I had a few glasses of a red Zinfandel called the Predator. And you know, it's it's not a science fiction movie from the '80s. It's huh. uh, it, it's called the Predator because this is an eco-friendly winery that uses ladybugs to eat the alphids that would damage the, the, uh, grapevines. And, uh, it was, it was a nice little bottle. It was very smooth. It had, uh, um, it was drinkable, I think is what you can say about it. Um, and now I'm drinking a $4 bottle of Fuji water that, you know, that was in the <laughs> hotel room here. Um, but, but to Jeff, you know, Jeff was saying that a Weizenbach or Weizenbach, I think is how they say it on, in uh, German, um, is, uh, would make a nice brag it. I've actually got a Weizenbach going right now, just as a, as a beer down in the fermenting room and it should be ready by the Super Bowl. And, uh, you know, I also have high hopes. I, it's a style that I may have only had one or two commercial versions of, but think, uh, but that, you know, what the hell, if, if I got, if there's a low bar to compare it to, that means the stuff I make, you know, got, got that low of a standard to meet. <laughs> hey, so Ryan, uh, let me get your opinion on this before the show started. Um, Jeff and Aaron and I were talking about box and, uh, loggers in general. And, um, that um, the possibility of just brewing something like a Bach as an ale. So what? G give your thoughts on that. We we decided that, uh, especially if we're making it into a braggot, we're sort of breaking the rules anyway. So uh, what do you think? I, I would tend to agree <laughs> that I think I think doing it as an ale uh, or – or really any lager style as an ale is, is appropriate. Um, and the reason I say that is my feeling is that I want the character that the yeast brings out. I think that that yeast is an equal ingredient or an equal, you know, contributor to the flavor of, of what I'm going for here. And I'm not, I'm not trying to make an American adjunct lager that's devoid of any flavor or taste. I want something that I, I can enjoy and, and I feel character and I feel that there's some, some flavor in. So I, I like that ale, you know, I like that, that ale quality to it. Uh, now with that being said, uh, I'll tell you that one style of beer that I have gotten into lately is called the India pale lager. And, and the reason that I, I've enjoyed a couple of India Pale Lagers is I think it really just isolates the hop if it's done properly. 
and and that I can get into a little bit, you know, on occasion. But overall, Chris, I, I agree with you guys. I think that that doing uh, lager styles as ales is um, that right on par with what I do. I mean, I've, I've got limited temperature control space, and um, you know, and if I'm gonna, I've made them before. I've made beers that are you know recipes as lagers. And I've done them as ales, and and I've I've been pleased with the results, but but like you say, you know, you and I have friends that are alcoholics, so they'll drink anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, let me uh, I'm let me jump you're in about approaching. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, let me jump in here for a minute. We, we've actually got a caller on the line. Uh, nine seven seven three. What's your name? Where are you from? And uh, welcome to the show. Hi, this is uh, Tony Cormier uh, from El Paso. Um, so, how bad did I, so, I, so how bad did I butcher your name? <laughs> um, not all that bad, actually. It all depends on what part of the country I'm in when I have when I hear it. Um, uh, my dad's from New England, so that's where the name came from. Um, well, welcome to the show, uh, Tony. Tony's the guy that I was talking about earlier. He contacted me just before the show, talking about the Kahlua, and and uh, you bet. Uh, can't do it tonight, Tony, but uh, damn straight. Let's compare some Kahlua recipes. Really interested in whatever you might want to share with us uh, about a uh, Prohibition-era recipe for a good Kahlua. But uh, did you have a question for any of the guys tonight? Um. Not really. Um, I or a comment. Was listening to you. <laughs> yes, I, I did have a comment. Um, you guys mentioned a few minutes ago about um, the uh, cranberry melomel, um, and you were saying something about um, trying to turn your your cranberry recipe into a mead. Um, I've done that with mine. Uh, I've done two runs of that so far. Um, still trying to perfect it, but I I add orange juice to mine as well, and it it makes a nice little zip to it. Do you uh, it just straight up orange juice, or do you use fresh oranges, fresh squeezed oranges, or how do you approach that? Um, preferably fresh squeezed, um, but in a pinch, the uh, the simply orange will do. And that's pure. That's pure. I like that. Of course, this is that that same brand of apple juice we use for that uh, graph. That simply, like simply apples. Yeah. I've seen it all over the pure, stores. Pure juice. Yeah, it, yeah. It, they make several different ones, and they're they're all real good. The ones I've tried. Well, t- uh, Tony, how'd you hear about the show? Um, actually, I was. Um looking on Facebook for uh, mead groups um, because I got into it about 2011. I just started doing my own thing. Didn't know there were groups about. And uh, then one day I got a wild hair and said, let's see if there's other people that are into this. And lo and behold, there was. And then I saw um, you post something about a show and then, uh, yeah. That's that's where it all started. Yeah, very good. Well, hey, welcome aboard. Uh, glad you're enjoying the show. Uh, this is the, this show is more about uh, the Mead House. It's kind of an entertaining show. Uh, we kind of wander off on different things, but uh, we do have a good time here talking about Mead. Um, hey, you're welcome to stick around if you like. Uh, right now, we need to move into Aaron's segment. Uh, Aaron. Um, I think Aaron Aaron's always got something going on in his mind. Now, I've never met this guy, but I can see the wheels turning in Aaron's brain just from our discussions in the past on the show, talking to him in private on a couple of occasions. Aaron, I know you've got a list going, stuff that you want to try, uh, stuff that you might have on a brew list uh, that you're just eager to to get into a fermenter. Uh, you ready to share that with us tonight? I am, definitely. Can, can I say something before Aaron starts? Sure. I think I think Aaron is dangerous because <laughs> here's a guy who, who, who doesn't 
talk about a lot of things he's brewing. He doesn't enter competitions. Uh, he doesn't put a lot of recipes out there. I'll bet you this guy's making some world-class mead that would blow us all away, and we just don't know about it. I think he's dangerous. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, that braggart he sent me was like a goddamn cattle prod. I mean, he got me going in the right direction. So, he's, uh, like that quiet, he's like that quiet kid that sits in the corner at school that, that the yeah. bully thinks he can beat up, but then when he jumps on him, he just whoops him all over the playground. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Oh, you're on to me, Chris. You're on to me. My uh, my best kept secret here. <laughs> what's on your uh, what, What's on your list, uh, Aaron? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, a few things on the list for 2017 here, and I, I think um, I, I may just start by prefacing this with kind of a throwback to really what got me into mead and interested in this beverage from the get go, which. Um, I, I think I've probably shared this story a couple of times now on the show, but it was when the Northern Brewer Homebrew Supply Shop opened here in Milwaukee uh, back in, what was it, 09, 2010 maybe, um, and Kurt Stock, who's a, a very well-known uh, mead maker, I think from from uh, Minnesota, came to the, the grand opening and brought several bottles of, of his mead to share with, with the customers and, and kind of give a demo of, of the mead making procedure. And it just, his, the, the stuff that he brought just knocked my socks off. It, it was just incredible. And, you know, I, I think what I've been kind of striving for with my mead making over the last seven years is, is really to try to replicate what, what he's, what he had put together there. And um, actually when I, when I've been giving some thought here to, to what's on the brew list for 2017, I, I think number one, I, I found a couple of recipes of his for some melomels that I want to share with the group. But then I, I have a little bit of a twist on this that I, I wanted to throw out to the group and, and get everyone else's thoughts on to see, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. Is it a good idea? Is it a bad idea? So with that being said, he's got these two melomels. And if you just, you know, go go online and Google, you know, Kurt Stock melomels, you'll be able to find these. One is a black currant cherry melomel. And the other is a superberry melomel. And uh, these are, are both probably more in the style of, of what Mississippi does over there with just really, really high gravity meads, you know, high alcohol that that wrap up with a pretty good amount of sweetness as well. And uh, basically, if you look at both of these, they both incorporate more than 20 pounds of honey. So the black currant one calls for 22 pounds of, of wildflower honey. Wow. Uh, for an, and you're going to need it. <laughs> you're going to need it. Yeah. The, uh, the approximate original gravity here is 1.161, that, which that's a Mississippi, <laughs> that's a Mississippi mead right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was thinking too when Dang. I saw something like that's that's a a Mississippi meat if I've ever seen one. So to balance all that sweetness, uh, he's he's calling for eight pounds of black currants and twelve pounds of tart cherries um, to to add, and then with that adding in just three gallons of water, which should be enough to to bring us to you know the five gallon mark with with the honey and, and the fruit in there as well. So timely discussion from earlier, listening to Chris and um, some of his, his experience with Lalazine, that, that may be a good way for me to go here as well. Um, so that's, that's the first recipe that's on the, the bucket list here or the, the brew list for 2017. Okay. It's a good one. I've made it. Uh, in fact, I think I've made every recipe that Kurt has ever posted. Um, and i tell you someone else who did, JD, do you remember us talking to, uh, Texas Dave 
Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Texas Dave made the uh, yeah. uh, multi berry or the super berry, I the believe super it was. Berry. I remember that. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, um, if I'm not mistaken, he sent me a bottle of that, and it was really good. All the stuff I got from him was good, and I believe that that, that multi berry was in there. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's that's actually recipe number two is Kurt's Super Berry Melamel. Um, similarly, it's just a, a huge amount of honey, 21 pounds of wildflower, but a triple berry mix. So if you go to the grocery store and, and walk down the frozen food aisle, you know, these days I always find myself gravitating to the fruit section to see what, what all types of fruits they have. And you'll find these triple berry mixes of blackberries, raspberries, and blueberries. So you'd pick up 12 pounds of those, 6 pounds of strawberries, and then 96 ounces of a black currant juice. Um, so this recipe would weigh in with a, a starting gravity of 1.158, so a little bit lower than the other one. Um, but then a, a target final gravity between 1030 and 1040. So, so both of these are just going to finish way, way on the sweet side. But when you, you know, you counterbalance that with the tartness and, and kind of that sourness that you're going to get from, from the currants and the tart cherries and, you know, all of the fruit, it just, it's something that's really, really wonderful. I, I think back to that Midnight Jack that Sergio sent to us. Um, and, and that was another one that just completely knocked my socks off. One of, one of my favorite meads that, that I can remember having. So, you know, I, I think, um, if I can replicate what and come anywhere close to what, what Kurt had at that day at that Northern Brewer grand opening, I'll, I'll be happy. Now, you know, I, I mentioned that I had a twist to, to these recipes and I, I want to get you guys' thoughts on this. Actually, this, um, this dates back to last week. It's an idea that I had. Um, I was drinking a beer on the, the show last week from Wicked Weed Brewing, and it was that recurrent, which was an American sour ale fermented with black currants. But what was interesting about it, I was reading the, you know, the, the label on here, and it says that um, they also aged this beer in Cabernet barrels. And there's just something that that this beer picked up that made it almost wine-like in, in quality. And, you know, when you couple that with that black currant flavor, it was just, it's, it's a beer that I'm just really hooked on right now. So it, it kind of got me thinking then for these, these Kurt Stock Melomels that he's posted out there. I, I wanted to get you guys' thoughts. So in the past, I, I know we've talked about taking like oak cubes and oak chips and, and soaking that in, you know, bourbon or, or other liquors. What about soaking it in like a Cabernet or, or some kind of a wine and then adding that to the mead? What are your thoughts about that? And, and then if you, if you think it's something that's worth trying, what about adding something like that to, to one of these melomels from Kurt? I don't know why it wouldn't work. I think soaking the oak cubes in the wine is is a good idea for the right mead. But as you said, I've made a lot of those high gravity uh, melomels like that, and for my particular taste, I just don't think that oak goes well with something with That's that sweet. much residual sugar. Yeah. Um, okay. <clears throat> Uh, I mean, I think it clashes because um, usually the reason I add oak is to get extra body or mouthfeel. Uh, I don't really add it to get oak flavor. And, you know, a mead like that is going to have enough body as it is. I would strongly suggest to you, if you're going to do that and you want to try it, I would go ahead and make a five-gallon batch. And I would rack three gallons of it into a three-gallon carboy and then use that other two gallons to test and see if you like oak in it or not. Uh, I would yeah. bet that you're going to find that you don't want oak in that at all, and it simply doesn't need it, really. 
there's there's so much going on there you've got so many layers of flavors and so much complexity it really doesn't need it at all mm-hmm. well there's a thing about adding oak too that i uh, and you know we've talked about it a couple of times on the show and this is another subject that, that we actually need to spend a little more time on because there is a formula that wine makers use i mean you're talking about surface contact area to volume to gallons of wine in a wine barrel uh and that's an extremely important thing to know because and i've even talked to uh, a couple of the local brew shops that sell wine barrels uh you've got to be very careful when you're aging anything in wine barrels and I, I don't know. I, I don't know that you can really fully duplicate the aging of mead or or even the, the homemade wines like I make, uh, the kit wines, uh, using oak cubes or oak chips. Uh, because I mean, how, how do you how do you figure out the surface contact formula? I mean, uh, that, that that's a real science. So. Uh, I, I'm I'm going with Chris, Aaron. I think I would uh, do a five gallon batch, uh, take a couple of gallons off, and play with it, and uh, see what you come up with. Yeah, I th- I think that's a great way to do it because I you know these just the melomels on on their own are so good, and it's such a, a rich, flavorful drink. I I would hate to you know, do anything to jeopardize a whole five gallon batch of that. So I, I really like that idea of pulling off three gallons and, and saving it. And and then maybe for the other ones, I, I try one that's just a plain, you know, oaked melomel. And then the other one could be uh, some kind of a Cabernet soaked um, oaked melomel as well. Uh, you know, one, one other thought that I had about that too, is if, if you do soak your oak cubes in, um, in a wine, I, I would be a little bit cautious to do that in an oaked wine, just because if if it's a you know different type of right. oak or something like that, it it might clash. You know, the the two oak flavors could clash with one another as well. Um, yeah, there's something about yeah. the honey sweetness. I, I wouldn't really say that the flavors clash, but there's I, the qualities clash. There's there's something about a honey sweetness quality and an oak quality that just clash with each other to me. That's uh, uh, hard let, to describe. Let's throw it back over to Ryan for just a second here. Ryan's working on these piments. Uh, what, what's the intent, Ryan? Are you looking for something sweet? Are you looking for something dry, something oaked? Uh, where, are you, where are you going with this? Well, with the, with the white version that I'm calling it a triple white, uh, the white I intend to leave unoaked, and I intend to take pretty dry. Um, you know, my wife and I, our, our go-to white wine is a dry Riesling, uh, which it's not uncommon, but the most people think Rieslings are sweet. And this is, you know, the, the dry Rieslings are what we enjoy. And so this is um, the white I... I'm going to take pretty dry. I'm going to let it age a little while. I, I hope some of the honey comes back in it and that it uh, it gives maybe a little of a perceived sweetness, even if it's not a, a gravity sweetness. What, what um, about the – going more along the lines with uh, what Aaron's trying to do here, what about the red? What what do you yep. – your Zinfandel? Uh, so jumping over to the red, this is um, – where I uh, I am going to oak this one. I've got a uh, uh, a Tuscan blend. It, it was called again at uh, Midwest Supplies. It's you know I, I guess supposed to mimic a, a Tuscan type barrel. And I am gonna I am gonna drop those in and uh, and oak this one. I don't want the oak to be a dominant force. In, in what you're getting, but I do want, uh, I, I do think that it's going to help um, round out the flavors uh, quite a bit. Sweet. I mean, you're going for, I mean, I, 
this about- one's going to be fair. Yeah, this one's going to be fairly dry as well. Um, you know, I mean, it's going to be along the same lines of what you would get if you were drinking a bottle of red Zinfandel or, or a so bottle that's, of... Uh, that's, that's kind of opposite of what Aaron's trying to do here because he's doing something, he's working with something with some incredible amount of sweetness. I mean, right. 22 pounds of wildflower honey, that, that, man, that, that's, that's going to be a sweet meat. Um 1161 starting gravity. Yeah. That'll, <laughs> yeah. That's up there. But, but, but you'll be surprised with, with eight pounds of black currants and then all the other fruit that's basically all of it is tart, except for maybe the blueberry part. Um, and very acidic, uh, especially like the, uh, the tart cherries, you got raspberries. Uh, there's a reason why that 40 year old mead was a raspberry, uh, very high acidity ages really well i think you know something Uh, that just uh i I don't mean to interrupt something that just flashed into my mind and if i don't say it i'll forget it uh think along the lines of a port wine okay because port wines are aged in barrels for sometimes years and years and years and i've got a couple of bottles here just uh i've got one that's almost a hundred year old port uh, so what if, what if you thought al- along those lines? Because you're working, some of these ports are, are fairly sweet. I mean, they're a dessert wine, an after-dinner wine. I mean, it's not like you pour a whole glass of port uh, like you would a glass of Cabernet and eat it with a steak dinner. So what what, what if you thought along the lines of a, a, a sweet port, aged, barrel-aged port, Aaron? Yeah, I like where you're going there. You know, I port is definitely a, a beverage that I enjoy. My wife really enjoys as well, and and I've had a hard time finding the right mead for her. So that something along those lines might be the right way to go. Um, I'm just trying to think how how to to replicate kind of a port style mead then. Mm. I don't know, Jeff. Because yeah, you've got other things going on there. You've got oxidation happening and yeah. lots of things. Jeff, well, uh, go ahead. You know, I've given some thought to doing a port style meat as well. And the, of course, the major barrier to this is the fact that it is technically illegal for, uh, for us to distill, uh, spirits in this country. So you, you really can't get the fortified, uh, spirit edition from a, a distilled mead like you would with a port wine. Yeah, um, you can go buy it in the bottle, right? I mean, you can sure. get a, get, go buy a bottle of cognac or, you know. You could use cognac. You could use uh, sherry or uh, another distilled uh, brandy, or what have you. You really couldn't get a distilled mead the same way you would, um, you would distill a, a similar uh, wine to the one you're, you're adding the, the distillate to. Um, yeah. But you could, you could take that approach. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there, are, there are other things you could do to it as far as adding adjuncts on on oak and things like that. It would actually probably be a really tasty beverage. Um, I, I like I, the sherry idea. The sherry would definitely give it a, a little something different, and realistically, it would also it, it might just because it is naturally oxidized in a, a way that is palatable to a lot of people. If you're into that kind of a thing, uh, it, it could help mask some oxidization as the, the meat ages too, realistically. Um, what what kind of sherry would you be using? Good question. <laughs> a good you one. <laughs> to to be perfectly honest, I I am not up on my sherries. I've had one or two. Um, I found yeah. them okay, but it's it's not the kind of thing I seek out. Here, here's here's the thing, okay, and I, I've applied, you know, I, I don't buy cheap whiskey, I don't buy cheap tequila, uh, you know, when I, when I want when I want to drink something good, I mean, I buy I buy the good stuff, okay. The bottles of whiskey and tequilas that I buy are over forty dollars a bottle, uh, and I've spent as much as one hundred and twenty dollars on on a bottle of tequila. Um, it's garbage in, garbage out. So if you go get the cheap crap, don't be surprised if it's going to taste like crap. 
so I, you know, I would shop around and get familiar. Now there's a, I'll have to email it to you. I can't think of the guy's name. Uh, there's a there's a guy on YouTube that he's a certified I don't know licensed taste tester uh, and he does whiskeys tequilas I mean just any kind of liquor you can think of uh, and he's got a, a a pretty good YouTube following so I'll, I'll get that information and send it to you um, but I, I I I like this direction Aaron so. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think it, it definitely sounds like an interesting direction to go. And, you know, I know one of the, the things that we like to discuss and just a, a, an interesting topic is that of experimentation. And I, I think, oh, yeah. you know, this is just an area where it's it's there are tons of experiment ideas that are kind of going through my mind right now in terms of, you know, adding adding different types of wine, port, sherry types of flavors to, to melomels and, and even piments too. I mean, that's, uh, that wasn't one that I was thinking about sharing during the show as a, uh, you know, on the, the brew list for this year, but piments is another area that, that definitely intrigues me as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, Aaron, uh, let me just say, I'm sure if you've looked into Kurt Stock, recipes you probably come across the uh, straw banner cabana Ooh, i don't know that i have actually <laughs> straw you have a, well, love yeah love yeah. the name though <laughs> well uh you might want to put that way down on the bottom of the list okay um yeah it seems like uh when i find someone who makes a style of mead that i like uh they always have one recipe that just I don't know. It, something's wrong. I made that recipe, and it's just wrong. I mean, even the alcoholics don't really care for it. Uh, but he won some contests with it, so maybe I did something really bad wrong. I thought I followed the directions, but um, all of his berry uh, melomels are great. Uh, that straw banana cabana is just weird. <laughs> okay. Really weird. <laughs> I'll yeah. steer clear of that one then. <laughs> well, Aaron, it sounds so like it sounds like you got. Uh, and I don't. Know, you know, we only talked about a couple of them. I know you got more than that, but uh, I tell you that uh, that black currant cherry uh, deal that you got going here. I mean, I could see several renditions of that one. Uh, I like the idea of a port style mead using those ingredients. Uh, I mean, that would be an awesome, uh, and I, I, I can see several, I can see several of your fermenters full of that with your, you know, maybe it's a cognac in one, maybe it's a, or, uh, you know, uh, yes. adding some, uh, oh yeah, baby. <laughs> I, like, I like where you're going. I'm um, getting thirsty just thinking about it, man. Our guest, Tony, right. you've been hanging out here all night with us here for uh, at least for the last half hour, 45 minutes. Tony, uh, brewing since or making meat since 2011. Uh, is there anything that you've got on your list for 2017 that you haven't done yet? Um, well, that I haven't done yet, um, I was thinking, um, a sizer with, um, sage, uh, to go good with pork dishes. Um, oh, yeah. uh, that one's been on my crew list for forever and a day. I just haven't gotten around to getting to that one. Um, I've been wanting to try out a, a pina colada type mead. Um, right. uh, before my brainwave leaves me, um, you guys were talking about the oak and and other stuff right now. Um, what about soaking your oak on your Kahlua and adding that to your coffee ML? What does hell. that do? What about soaking your oak in Kahlua and adding that to like a port or a I mean a, a stout or a porter? 
holy cow, dude, you just, oh man, I got to write this down. <laughs> <laughs> I've been, um, uh, go ahead. Uh, another to brew list is, um, I, I've been wanting to make an Acer Glen for a while now. Um, I've just now uh, what, what's, what's, what's an Acer Glen now? Um, that's made with, um, maple syrup, maple syrup. That's right. Okay. I've got a semi uh-huh. Acer Glen going that, that banana bread that I was telling you about. Yeah. Uh, it's got a quart of maple syrup mm-hmm. in it along with the honey and everything else. Well, the one thing that I've always heard about maple syrup, and I, I got this over from doing the old show, uh, was that it's very hard for to get the maple flavor because syrup is like the that that's like you know when when you put it in the fermenter, that's like the first thing the yeast goes after, uh, I, you know, and it it goes it, it ferments all the way out, so. Uh, how confident are you that this maple syrup is going to contribute to a flavor? I'm thinking about um, putting it in in secondary. Mm, okay. um, but that's just preliminary thoughts right now. I, I'm nowhere near um, ready to start anything new. I have to go out and get some more local mesquite honey. Did you... Chris, did you put, uh, did you add the maple up front or are you waiting until? Uh, well, what I did was I, I held out the maple until most of the fermentation had died down. And uh, once it started uh, getting down pretty low, then I added in the maple uh, so that it still fermented. And I'm sure it fermented out, but it wasn't there during the most vigorous fermentation so hopefully that held in more of the flavor and aromatics yeah so more of a late addition yeah just a late addition uh like uh i think i added it about maybe 50 percent of the way maybe a little over 50 percent through the fermentation and then i went ahead and added it in uh and and really didn't even bother trying to stir it that much or dissolve it i just basically poured it in gave it a light stir and uh um i I put it in um i don't have my logbook in front of me but i actually think i put it in along with my final degassing which would have been right around day seven um so when i did that final degassing i went ahead and stirred that in and and i don't even think it got dissolved but the yeast will find it they'll they'll get it yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, uh, well, guys, to wrap the show up, I've got um, I've got this. Uh, I, I was toying around with this. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the show, we were talking. And Chris asked something about uh, doing a lager as an ale. Uh, I found this. Uh, it's a beer recipe, basically, um, and uh, it's a lager. I mean, it uses the the. Uh, uh, no, this is liquid malt extract, but the the Pilsen. Uh, style liquid malt extract, and then there's stuff called I don't know what this is soft candy sugar blonde. I have no idea what that is. Um, really, it's a Belgian sugar. It's it's caramelized sugar. They they try to call it fancy stuff. It's caramelized sugar. So um, how does that does that contribute any kind of flavor or it contributes sugar that turns into alcohol really easily. <laughs> the, the Belgians use it to boost up the alcohol Tip- by volume. Okay, so I Typically don't. Typically, really... the darker the the darker the fl- color, and you'll get a little more flavor. That's the, true. Get- the lighter oh. stuff is very very neutral, and the darker stuff can contribute a little bit of body to it. And as Jeff was saying, that's typical in in, in certain Belgian styles. So remember when we were talking took- about the Belgian quads. Uh, yeah, that's right. where most of that dark color comes from. Is is from that candy sugar. Okay, so if I took uh, say a half pound or a pound of dark brown sugar and just put it in my little uh, uh, frying pan deal and just uh, caramelized it, I'm going to accomplish the same thing, right? 
You think? You know, if you were if you were uh, using candy making methods, you know, and there are some, yeah, you know, things that you want to do to make sure the temperature is right and the and the yeah. sugar is taken care of, then yeah. basically yes. Okay. All right. Uh, well, it kind of goes, you know, and that, and that, uh, that may be, I mean, I might even be able to cross that off the list because of course the next thing, this is why I went, you know, I did that crock pot thing uh, this afternoon. Uh, but this, uh, this is, I'm calling this Minnesota blonde braggot because this is a, a beer that's typically brewed in Minnesota as a lager. Uh, and, uh, I'm turning it into a braggot. So, uh, you know, it's got, uh, six, uh, a little over six pounds of the Bilsner. I'm going to add three pounds of, uh, honey to it, uh, wildflower honey. But I'm thinking now that I may lightly caramelize the honey. I, I really, I don't want a real dark, I don't want the, uh, I don't want I don't want the roasted marshmallow. I want it just before it gets to roasted marshmallow. And it's got this mm-hmm. uh, Herzbrucker hops uh, in it. Uh, but anyway, so that, that that's a recipe that I'm working on uh, for my next uh, braggot project. Of course, I still have the uh, uh, the uh, cream orange uh, deal going in the fermenter. It's in the last stages of fermentation right now. So. So let me that ask you. Right? Really I just had another. I just had another brain flash. The something you just said triggered this. You know, I was talking about possibly doing a braggot uh, with a Belgian quad, and the Belgian quad recipe calls for the D one eighty Belgian candy syrup, which is the darkest of all of them. Um, what if you did that with honey? Yeah. Maybe just really caramelize it until it's just, I mean, absolutely black. Substitute that out. You think that would work? Um, I've seen a video on YouTube uh, where the, he does that. Um, I'll have to find that. But, yeah, he did it until black smoke came out of the bubbles and made a I mean, I didn't do that to my uh, oh, yeah. my book. <laughs> uh, I did mine in a crock pot for nine hours on low and then one hour on high, and it's tasting great right now. Nine hours? <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah. I, wow. Well, I mean, I, I set it in there, and then I went to work, and then I came home, turned it on high for an hour, and turned it off and put everything Good. in my uh, fermentation bucket. Yeah, and JD, wow. when I told you three to four hours on high earlier yeah. to get you know the level I'm looking for, I'm yeah. looking for molasses black. Uh, I'm I'm looking okay. for dark, so that'll get okay. you there. Okay. Well, I I you but know you, I mean the, I need to play around with the crock pot thing anyway. I did it. I've got some molasses in a couple of quart jars here that I did in the pressure cooker. Uh, that's dangerous because uh, you have no idea. Uh, what's happening to your honey? Uh, and this is only after I think it was a thirty-minute, uh, a thirty-minute cook. I did it a couple of times. The second, the first time I did it was something around the the, the uh, something along the lines of a ninety-minute uh, cooker pressure cooker. And you talk about I, I mean, I can I can roof a house with this stuff, dude. Uh, <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know what the hell to use it in yet, but I'm going to use it. But so I'm thinking something a little bit lighter than that, but just before, you know, because there was a stage, I did it a couple of times. There's a stage you get to just before it gets campfire marshmallow. Now I like that flavor. Okay. But I want to stop it before it gets there. I want the roasted marshmallow. I don't want the campfire taste. Okay, sure. so that's what I'm trying to avoid, and that's why I went out and got the crock pot. I don't think I can do that in a, in a pressure cooker. I, I mean, I, I'd, I'd go, I'd go through my five gallon bucket of honey in in no time, trying to get to the right place. So, uh, 
So that, that's why I got the crock pot. So. And, and just as a heads up, I've, I've mentioned it before on the show. I, I don't know if I've mentioned it recently, but when you're toasting uh, the honey in the crock pot, you, you do have to keep an eye on it because that the level of coloration goes exponentially. You know, the you get one shade after two hours, the next shade comes an hour later, and then within the last 10, 15 minutes, it goes from kind of a vague orange to a, a really dark brown. I mean, the last stages of that coloration happen really fast. Yeah. So it, it bears keeping an eye on. Did I lose Ryan? No, I'm here. Okay. Uh, I thought that might have been me, Ryan. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I just, you know, uh, I, I need to, I was going to do it today and then, uh, uh, the show was coming up. I had to get my wife, I'd get her off to work and everything. And I thought, you know what? I need a day where I'm not doing anything. I need to concentrate on doing this, uh, honey thing in the crock pot. So, uh, maybe this, uh, this coming weekend or something, I'll, I'll give it a shot. But, um, at any rate, uh, guys, I think we've wasted enough time on tonight's show. <laughs> There's so many things going on. Aaron, I am super excited, dude. Uh, you know, my bragging thing is your fault. Now I'm, now I'm thinking, now I got this port thing going on, uh, in my brain. Uh, and I'm thinking, I, you know, I'm thinking something uh, with that black currant cherry melmel deal, with all that fruit and uh, that high gravity, all that sweetness, and adding, you know, maybe eight ounces of a nice, good, uh, rich sherry to it. Uh, I don't know that I'd even bother with the oak at that point. Um, but if you do, I, you know, I, th- I don't know that I would even soak the oak in anything. I would probably just put the oak in just for a short amount of time uh, and see what happens. But, mm-hmm. I mean, dude, the wheels are turning. Yeah, so I, got, we- I blame Aaron and Jeff for the braggart thing. <laughs> uh, now, now, Tony's come along and got me thinking about doing something with Kahlua. Uh, as of right now, Ryan is still the only one in good standing. So, uh, don't, don't come along with any more ideas, Ryan. (laughs) Do my best. And, uh, hey, Tony, thanks for, uh, thanks for calling the show, dude. If you want to hang out, we usually have about a 10 or 15 minute little, uh, pre or post show, uh, hang out here. Uh, but, uh, with that, we're going to wrap we're going to wrap things up. Uh, Mississippi, uh, gosh, it was, uh, it was it was nice to have you hanging out with us tonight, too. Glad you didn't have to go back to work. Or maybe you still do. I do. Just not do. when I thought. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, you know what? Uh, why don't we get back together next week, about 9 o'clock? What do you think? Tuesday night? And we'll do this all over again. So, uh, We'll see you at the meet house.